This is Untangled, fly fishing for everyone. Presented by Ventures Fly Company. So I would like to formally announce to all the advertising executives who are undoubtedly listening to the show right now, uh, Untangled is officially open to Coke being a sponsor of the show. As you can see here, uh, I got my Diet Coke. Kind of have a little bit of a love affair with Diet Coke. So we are willing, in fact, nay, we are happy to give sponsorship of this show or proper monetary compensation, of course, uh, to Coke. So those of you at Coke who are undoubtedly listening to Untangled, please uh, drop us a line and uh, let's get in touch. Let's figure out how we can make a, a relationship that works really well for uh, for both parties, shall we? <laughs> oh, mm. something about Diet Coke just hits right. And if you didn't already know that I was a teacher, uh, seeing me enjoy Diet Coke that much should give it away. <laughs> Uh, it's kind of the lifeblood of a lot of teachers. So, uh, welcome to the show, folks. Welcome to it. This is Untangled, and I am your host, Spencer Durant. This is episode 15, which means that we are exactly one episode away from the big one. Episode 16 is coming at you next week, featuring the entire VFC crew, me, Alex Berkeley. We're going to be talking down, sitting down to talk shop and chat about some of the new products that we've got coming out here at VFC. So definitely make sure you tune in for that one. And if you guys have any questions specifically about fly tying, let us know. And any other questions that you have for the show, as always, there is a link in the podcast description where you can go and submit your questions. We'll get them in here. We'll get them answered. And hopefully I'll make you laugh while you're listening to it. Uh, so I think that kind of covers everything for us here at the beginning of the show. Uh, we are going to be chatting today about how to find carp. So if you find that disgusting, uh, keep listening because carp really aren't that gross. I mean, I've had a more disgusting fish in my time. Now, I'm not the biggest fan of carp. I'm going to say it out right now, but fishing for them is kind of a unique experience that I think is worth it for a lot of anglers, you know, kidding aside. We're also going to chat about rigging up your gear and building your own leaders. Plus, I get to get on my soapbox today about sunglasses. So that's a soapbox you don't want to miss, I promise. Anybody who's heard it before, it's a good one. Plus, I got a great story to tell about that. And speaking of stories, I was hoping to have some fishing stories to share with everybody, but I woke up this morning here in Wyoming to like three or four inches of snow. Took the dog out this morning and he disappears up to his belly. Now, granted, he is a tiny little dog. My wife got a little pappy on. And, well, okay, I say my wife got him. We got him, but my wife picked out the breed. She wanted the pappy on, so that's what we ended up with. Uh, not really a fishing dog, because he's about the size of a lot of the fish. He is tiny. And no, that's not like some weird humble brag about, well, I only catch big fish. Uh, he's just, he's a pretty small dog. Uh, anyways. We're buried under snow again. So I'm just hoping that at some point, all these flies I've been tying lately, I actually get to put to use. Because uh, well, I've got the one river close by that's got blue wings hatching, and that's about it right now. I am itching to get out. I think everybody else is, too. I think the fish are. I think the fish miss us. I really, I really do. I think they miss coming to say hi to us. I think they miss watching us get angry when they refuse our flies. I don't care what anybody says, fish take a perverse pleasure in looking at your fly and bumping it with their stupid little nose and then saying, eh, you know what, nah, and then swimming off. There's some pleasure they take in that. There has to be, right? There's got to be. Oh, all right. I'll quit yammering. We'll get to the questions. First one here is from David out in New Jersey. Says, first timer, do you load up your lines before you travel to your spot or tie up everything when you get there? I can't fit a nine foot rod in my car. Question mark, question mark, question mark. I always break down my salt rods. Hey, David, interesting question. All right. Thanks for writing in. I'm going to go ahead and assume that you mean, do I keep all of my rods rigged up before I travel to a new fly fishing spot? 
Well, I usually don't rig up until I'm actually there on the water. Unless I know the river really well and already know what I'm going to fish, I usually base my fly choices on what I see when I get there. I'll actually leave a link to a whole series that we did on picking flies in the podcast description so that if that's something you've struggled with lately or you want to try and get better at, like, I'm at the river, how do I know what in the devil to fish, this blog post series will help you figure that out. Uh, I do have my reels spooled up, obviously, before I head to the river. Uh, but usually I wait to put my rods together until then. Uh, most folks can't fit a nine foot rod in their car, David. So uh, don't certainly don't feel bad <laughs> that you can't. Uh, it, I, I think that's kind of normal. Uh, it's just break it down and assemble it on the water. Now, there are roof racks. You've seen different companies make them. Uh, you can make one yourself out of PVC pipe if you feel so inclined. Uh, they let you haul around fully strung up fly rods. They're great if that's something you're interested in. In fact, I even made my own based off of a buddy system. I was driving around a while ago before I got my Tacoma. Yes, I know another fly fisherman who drives a Tacoma. Can be original Durant. I know, I know. Okay, but I, I got a Tacoma before this whole Tacoma craze caught on. All right, I just like that out there. And Alex here at VFC bought himself a Tacoma after falling in love with mine. So, if anything, I'm a gall dang trendsetter, the way I see it, okay? Before I had my Tacoma, I was driving around a mom wagon, uh, like a 2003 Honda CRV, and I actually strung up a whole thing where I could sit the rods fully strung up in some loops in the car uh, that hung on the handles and uh, clothes hooks in the car and strung that up together. It was really nice because I could fit like half a dozen fully strung up fly rods inside the car. So it was a little less obvious that I had fly rods than the roof rack, which really says, hey, come steal all my you know, $1,000 fly rods. That's what the roof rack says. So I'm a little wary of getting one for that reason. In fact, I knew a guy who, he was a guide out in Dutch John, Utah, on the Green River, and he had his car broke into. And they took the stereo, and he had some cash because he was a guide. Guides usually have cash. And they took the stereo, they took the cash. Well, he had three brand new Sage fly rods in the tubes in his back seat. These didn't even touch him. So uh, that's why I kind of shy away from the roof racks because that kind of advertises, here's some high dollar stuff to come steal. <laughs> maybe I'm just a little, par- maybe I'm just a little bit too paranoid. I don't know. But uh, what was the question originally? <laughs> Here, David, I'm sorry I got off on the tangent. Yes, breaking your fly rods down. Hopefully that answers your questions and uh, and, and makes you feel like you're, you're not abnormal. You're not. We all usually just rig up when we get there to the river. Thank you very much. Next question is Andrew from Kansas City. I'm not sure which Kansas City, if it's the Missouri or Kansas side of the city. Uh, but he says, so not much for trout near me. So my questions are directed at warm water, best tactics for finding carp. I have waded streams, rivers, and find it very hard to find them. No, water is not super clear, but not too muddy either. Yes, I'm using polarized sunglasses. Also, if you recommend somewhere I can get good prescription polarized sunglasses, that'd be great. Should I get a kayak, use the help of a drone? I know carp fishing is all sight fishing, and I'm trying to catch stuff near home. Any advice would be great. Andrew? You bring up some really interesting questions here. So let's uh, let's dive into things. Uh, first thing I want to chat with you, though, is the sunglasses bit. Uh, I know both Smith and Costa offer prescription polarized sunglasses, as does Bahio. I've fished all three brands and love them. I have great things to say about all of them. Uh, Smith is really great. I also use their goggles for skiing. So... Uh, And no, Smith is not sponsoring this podcast. I just happen to like their stuff. Right now, I am partial to the Rose Mirror Lenses from Bahio, which are available in prescription. I've personally never worn a lens that's so good. It doesn't add a whole ton of color like your usual like amber uh, polarized lenses, but it cuts the glare and is really, really comfortable on the eyes. My eyes don't get tired wearing those and it cuts the glare beautifully those are the rose mirror lenses from Bahio 
Uh, I can't say enough good stuff about them. Everybody that I've let use them loves them too. Bahio really hit it out of the park with that set of lenses, in my opinion. Now, I do want to get on a little bit of a soapbox. We're talking about sunglasses. I'm going to stand on one. Plus, I tease the soapbox at the beginning of the show. So I kind of got to deliver, right? Uh, to any angler who's listening to the show and wondering, if good glasses are worth the money, you know, you're going to spend 200 bucks on a good pair of polarized sunglasses. Are they actually worth it? They 100% are. I'm really, really protective of my eyes because if my sight goes, I really can't fish anymore. And with all the time I spend outside between hunting and fishing, it feels like protecting my eyes is one of those like really easy, simple things to do that I should do, especially because I'm actually deaf in my left ear. Uh, which is really helpful when my mother-in-law's around because I just tell her that my hearing aid was on mother-in-law mode and I couldn't hear her. And for some reason, she takes great offense to that. It actually does have a mother-in-law mode. Okay, that's one of the best things about the uh, the hearing aid uh, that I have. It's got that fancy mother-in-law mode to it. Why do you think I bought it? <laughs> Anyways, uh, with my hearing going, and I'm a young guy, well, youngish, I'm not that young anymore, uh, but with my hearing starting to go, it's made me even more aware of my sight as well. So I'm always, I've always got sunglasses on. I actually used to drive school bus for a living, and I knew tons of other drivers who never wore their sunglasses, and they always had that perpetual squint. They were looking at you like they're pissed off the whole time. Now, I'm no eye doctor, but I know that it's worth it to protect your eyes. So if I need a disclaimer here to say, hey, I'm no doctor. Don't take my medical advice. You know, there's that disclaimer, but really it seems like common sense. Protect your eyes. It cuts the glare, saves you from the UV. Your eyes are going to thank you for it. And it helps you see the fish at, at the end of the day. It makes, it, it helps make you a better angler. It's one of those few pieces of gear that a good pair of sunglasses can really help you kind of take a step because you can see the fish a little bit better. It's not this magical thing that's going to make you an expert caster, but it does help you kind of see the fish better, see under the water better, so you can you can create a better picture of what the river actually looks like it, and, and where your flies need to go and where the fish are holding. Uh, I know when I switched over to polarized sunglasses in my fishing career, it really was like a, a switch got flipped. So I, I really have to stand behind that and say, yes, they are worth it. I don't care what brand you buy. You buy whatever you want. I told you what I prefer, but they're definitely worth the money and worth the investment. And they really do protect your eyes from a lot of other stuff besides uh, just the UV glare. Okay, An example of that, I was in Alaska two years ago now. Yeah, it was two years ago. I'm in Alaska with my best friend, Lander. And we're fishing salmon on the Kenai River. And if you've ever fished for sockeye on the Kenai, you know, you're using those big lead banana weights, those two ounce banana weights. They're about yay big. If you're watching the video podcast, you can see that. Uh, They're pretty big and, you know, pretty substantial amount of weight. And you've got the lead banana weight and then like 15 inches of tippet, I think is what you have to have of like 30 pound fly line and then your fly on the end of it not fly line, 30 pound test fishing line, and then your fly on the end of it. And you throw that out there and the weight drags against the bottom and you try and snag the salmon in the mouth. That's how you fish for sockeye. So we're sitting there doing that. And I go, uh, I go to set the hook on what felt like a fishy bite. And it was because I set the hook and the fish just tears off downstream and it's shoulder to shoulder fishing. It's the end of July. Everybody and their dog is on the Kenai. So it's not just me and my buddy Lander. It's me, and my buddy Lander, and a few thousand other anglers, right? And so I'm sitting there trying to keep this fish from going too far down and tangling other people's lines. You don't want to be that guy that's running down like, oh, sorry, I need you to get out of the way. <laughs> Look at me. I got a fish. <laughs> you don't want to be that guy. I didn't want to be that guy. So I'm kind of wailing on this fish trying to get it to turn so it'll come back into the current i can put it in the net and you know get on with my night of fishing and i must not have hooked it very good because i'm sitting there just got the rod straight up like this the line is straight down river from me so the rod straight up the line is straight down the river from me and all of a sudden the line just gives 
and I kind of stumble. And then there's this loud crack, like a gunshot. And all of a sudden, the right side or left side of my face feels weird. And I spin around, a complete 360. I spin around, fall into the river, fill my waders up, and I come back up wondering, what just happened? And my sunglasses, I had a pair of Smith's Guide Choice XL sunglasses on. I still have this pair because it's really cool what happened to it. But that big lead weight shot back when the hook came free, shot all the way back upriver and beamed me right there in the eye, shattered the glass lenses. And then I, you know, proceeded to do my pirouette and fall into the river like an idiot. But if I hadn't been wearing my sunglasses, that lead weight's going straight into my eye. I probably lose the eye. And if you've been fishing for long enough, you probably have a story just like that or know somebody who does. So like I said, that's my soapbox. But if I hadn't been wearing good sunglasses, you know, a, a little cheapy pair probably is just going to break. And, you know, maybe embed shards of plastic or glass or whatever the lens is made out of into my eye. So any way you slice it, it was not a good situation. But I came out of that pretty lucky because I had a good pair of shades on. So that's my little soapbox moment. Hopefully you guys Take something meaningful from that. Uh, again, none of these sunglasses companies are paying me. This is this 100%. You now, me as an angler talking to other anglers, which is what this show is all about, right? Be here to help. So, uh, Andrew, thank you for letting me uh, hijack uh, your question a little bit to pontificate about the need for good eye protection. I'm going to get back to your question, Andrew, about carp. We're, we're going to talk about the carp portion of it. Joe Cermelli. Uh, wonderful angler, wonderful writer, uh, great podcast host, just all around good guy. I've never met Joe. I've worked with him a few times through email on, on a field and stream project. Uh, but we have some mutual friends. Everybody's got good things to say about Joe. So he wrote this story in Outdoor Life that you're probably going to want to read. It's a beginner's guide to fly fishing for carp. And the link is in the podcast description. So everything you need to know about fishing for carp is going to be in that uh in that guide from joe uh and i'll be referencing that uh in a few minutes here now you definitely don't want to use a drone to look for carp uh (laughs) first off that's to scare the crap out of the fish uh second off it's not exactly what we would call sporting right same reason you don't use drones for hunting uh it's it's not sporting you you want to give the wildlife a chance you want to give excuse me i'm getting over a bit of a cold here so if i I sound really raspy, like I'm trying to be uh, Jeff Bridges. (laughs) That's why. Uh, Anyways, you want to give the wildlife a chance, a sporting chance, right? So drones eliminate that. Plus, a lot of laws, uh, or a lot of states, pardon me, have laws on the books for chasing wildlife with drones. So you definitely don't want to do that. That's not a good idea. My best advice is to find some water that has some clarity to it because it's really tough to catch carp if you're just casting blind. Joe Cermelli, in that piece that I just referenced, he said in the story, and I will quote, there are some anglers out there who will tell you they routinely catch carp on the fly blind, meaning they only feel the take. I say that's rubbish. Is it impossible? No, but it's never happened for me. Likewise, the fun of fly fishing for carp is that it's visual. It's a sight fishing game, hence the comparisons to saltwater redfish and the nickname Golden Bonefish. That's the end of his quote there. So with that in mind, you say the water is not super clear. Well, if you you want to be successful for carp, you're going to need to find water that's got some level of clarity to it. If you don't have that, then you're, you're, you're going to be in a tough spot trying to catch these fish. They're not made, uh, or they're not made, they're not as easy to catch when you're fishing blind for them. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning of the show, I'm not the biggest fan of carp fishing. That's true just for reasons that I won't get into here, but I don't, I don't have any disdain for it, right? I'm not out here like, oh, you shouldn't fish for carp. That doesn't make you a real fly fisherman. Or that's, not, that's not where I'm coming from with this. It's just if I have the option for carp or trout, I'm going to choose trout. That's really kind of where it comes down to. But the times that I've gone carp fishing when trout were an option, 
it's it's a lot of fun and it's fun watching them eat that fly. And I agree with Joe here hundred percent. If I couldn't see them take it, there is no way, <laughs> there's no way that I would be able to tell that they'd eaten that fly. Cause a lot of the times, in fact, not a lot of times, almost every time, every carp that I've ever caught, I have not felt them eat the fly. I've watched them because they can suck it in and spit it out so quick that if you can't see them do it and set that hook, you're probably not going to catch them. So I would suggest that you spend more time looking for carp in ponds since like the urban carp scene is usually pretty good these days. I used to have a handful of those carp ponds near the place where I lived in Utah and I always fished for there instead of the, uh, fished for carp there instead of the river because they were a lot easier to see. There were bigger carp in the river, but I couldn't really see those fish. So I always went to those ponds and did that when it was run off and I couldn't fish for my trout. Now, if the water isn't muddy, like you said, but it's not super clear either, you could look for like telltale signs of that carp are actively feeding. That would be like you see its tail breaking the surface and the rest of the fish angled down into the water. That means that the carp is actively sucking bugs off the bottom. And if you can get a fly in front of it, your chances of catching that carp are going to be really high. Again, you want to look for the cleanest water you can find. Spend some time walking around. Prioritize ponds over rivers, and you should be able to find some fish. Hopefully, that answers your question, Andrew. But thank you uh, for sending that one in. That was a great one. I mean, you remember those old uh, Uncle Sam posters with him pointing at you all, angry looking like, I want you to join the U.S. Army. Well, imagine me in that poster instead, and I'm pointing to you and saying, I want your fly fishing questions for the Untangled podcast, because I do. All right. Any question that you have you would like to be answered that's fly fishing related, please send those questions on in. That's what this show is all about. I love answering these questions. I love helping out other anglers, and I love this community that we've built so far. Uh, It's been really fun to watch this thing grow, so please send in your questions. There's a link in the podcast description. Uh, You can find links to submit questions all over VFC websites and social media as well. So get those questions in, and remember, I want your fly fishing questions. All right, and just like that, we are getting, uh, not getting, we are at the uh, last question of the show. So, Zach from Arizona writes in, Tippet ratios slash recipes or tapered leaders. Do seasoned vets only cast their own leaders built off of tippet with different sizes and lengths, or are there situations in which seasoned anglers will actually use a tapered leader out of the package? I've fly fished far too long to be asking this question, but this feels like an unspoken thing amongst seasoned pros. My guess is people are only buying multiple spools of fluoro and building as the needs arise. Thoughts? Zach, a really interesting question here, especially the way that you phrased it with like seasoned vets doing this and newbies not doing that. Uh, So I went ahead and uh, chatted with a few of my longtime fishing buddies, folks who've been doing this longer than I have. Uh, and with the exception of one of my buddies who's a guide, and he only uses like a five foot piece of fluoro for his leaders, uh, but he also fishes kind of unique water too, so he can get, get away with it. Uh, but with the exception of him, almost everybody's fishing a tapered leader right out of the package. Uh, I know a lot of anglers who like to build their own leaders, and that's great, but not all of us have the extra time for that, especially guides aren't going to have the extra time for that, nor really the inclination to do it. You really need a tapered leader of some kind to have your flies cast correctly. That taper is what helps turn over your flies and present them to fish in the most realistic way possible. I personally don't tie my own leaders. Like I said, though, uh, I know some anglers who do. Being a quote-unquote seasoned vet doesn't really have anything to do with it. Because a veteran angler knows you need a tapered leader, so they're not automatically going to turn their nose up one, right? They're not going to say, oh, that's one of those Rio tapered leaders straight out of the package. No, thank you. I'm going to go over here with my hand-tied Maxima filled leader and 
I smoke on this pipe and dust off my tweed before I take a downstream cast with a wet fly. Okay, well, the seasoned pros aren't, aren't looking at that. They're saying, hey, I need a tapered leader. Do I have one? All right, th- that's really where they're getting to. Now, like I said, some anglers really might be, okay, I'm going to do it this way. This is how my leader's got to be, and I'm not going to use one out of a package. But I think those folks are fewer and further between than the folks that are more will, more than more than happy to just go ahead and use whatever comes right out of the package. Uh, really, those instances where you need a leader that you can't buy out of the package is pretty rare. Uh, I do have one buddy, Ryan McCullough, a really good friend of mine. He builds his own 15 foot 7x leaders. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 15 foot 7x leaders. And I'm not laughing at you, Ryan. I'm I'm not. It's just when you say that out loud, it's just 15 foot 7x leader. <laughs> it's just something funny about it. <laughs> oh, I love you, Ryan. Anyways, he's starting, he's basing that all off of a prepackaged 4x leader, right? Because there will be situations where we're going to add tippet to our leaders and lengthen them, right? You're you're going to need to add a couple feet of tippet in some instances. Uh, you're going to need to take your 4X and maybe you do need to knock it down to 6X. Maybe you're on that tailwater that's really pressured and the fish won't take it. If it's 5X, you know, there's some micro drag that's affecting it. You have to step it down. In that instance, yeah, you're going to build out a leader that way. And, but I wouldn't say that's like a seasoned vets thing. That's something that you learn as you go through this and you do it as the need arises. Right. It's not something you automatically do just because, oh, well, I'm a seasoned vet now. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Look at all these peasants using the prepackaged leaders. <laughs> That's really not uh, the attitude. And and I'm not trying to poke fun at you uh, here, Zach. I promise. I'm, I'm just having fun with the hoity-toity attitude. This is a really good question. I, I appreciate it. Uh, anyways. Every angler, like I said, is going to be adding on tippet. That's something to expect to have to do when you're fishing. Uh, but I, I wouldn't be like, oh, the only way that I can be a real seasoned pro at this, the only way that I can kind of break into that next echelon of my angling knowledge is if I'm using my own leaders. That, that's just not true. Use what you need for the situation. That's really what fly fishing comes down to. If you need a leader, that isn't prepackaged, yeah, build it. Go ahead and do it. There's nothing wrong with that. But you're not gonna you're not going to shoot yourself in the foot by using a prepackaged leader. There's nothing amateurish about it. So uh take that for what it's worth. Uh I've used them my my entire career and I know plenty of other anglers who have as well. So thank you for the question. And with that brings us to the end of the show. So remember. Episode 16 next week. It's the big one. And we're going to have some fun with it. All right. I I promise it's going to be a good time. And hopefully we've got some fun fishing stories to share. I'm actually headed out tomorrow to go fishing, Uh, leaving snowy Wyoming and heading to hopefully less snowy climbs. But we'll see if the forecast is true or if the weatherman is, as per usual, dead wrong. Remember, if you have any questions that you would like answered about fly fishing, anything at all, please go ahead and submit those. Your questions are what keeps this show running and going and being such a smooth, fun operation to have a little bit of a role in here that I do. I really enjoy doing this, really enjoy getting your questions and getting to know folks uh, as this show progresses. So go ahead make sure that you submit those questions there's a link in the podcast description and i will plan on seeing y'all here in one more week for episode 16 the whole vfc crew is going to be here until then tight lines everybody